Welcome to the first of a series of webinars that uh, Whitehall Training are running. Um, this one's on uh, an introduction to good clinical practice or GCP. Um, good clinical practice being the rules that underpin the way that clinical trials are run and um, make sure that the people who are involved in the trials remain as safe as possible. Um, now I'm going to pitch this at a level that um, should be useful for those who have done GCP before but are looking for a, a bit of a reminder, but also those who haven't done it before, haven't got a medical background. So hopefully um, it'll be useful for all of you. Uh, and I know that the participants, um, I can see that you've got a range of levels of experience. Some of you who know GCP fairly well, um, and some of you who are completely new to it, but just interested. So um, I will pitch it accordingly. Right, well, first of all, before I launch into the rules themselves, give you a little bit of a history lesson. Um, obviously the rules of good clinical practice didn't come into, um, come into being fully formed. Um, they were the result of sort of incremental developments of various other things. Uh, and their earliest ancestor, if you like, can be traced back over a hundred years to the P US Pure Food and Drug Act. This was a piece of legislation brought in to stop foods and medications being adulterated uh, in the US, obviously. There wasn't really anything in present uh, present to do this before that piece of legislation. Nothing else happened on a legislation front uh, until after the end of World War II. Everyone is familiar with the Nuremberg trials at which a number of high profile Nazis were prosecuted for their war crimes. Um, among them were a number of Nazi scientists who had been carrying out unethical to say the least, trials testing various things on prisoners of war. So in 1947, the Nuremberg Code was put together with the aim of preventing this kind of thing happening again. Uh, and the Nuremberg Code had 10 points and it defined how valid and legitimate research ought to be conducted, but it wasn't legally binding. Uh, the next development was in 1964 with the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, this was produced by the World Medical Association, which was a group of physicians, and it was really aimed at promoting medical ethics. Uh, again, it was a set of research guidelines, and once more, it wasn't legally binding, and so it was slightly open to interpretation in different countries. Um, it's still a relevant document, was actually revised several times most recently in 2000. 1979 saw the Belmont Report. This was um, further guidance on how participants in trials should be protected, uh, focusing particularly on respect, beneficence and justice. 1982, um, Bit of a self-explanatory title there, International Guidelines for Biomedical Research Involving Human Subjects. This was produced by the World Health Organization and the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences or SIOMS. Uh, and it, the aim was to help developing countries apply the principles of the Declaration of Helsinki and the Nuremberg Code. So GCP as we recognize it didn't appear until 1990. Uh, and the GCP rules uh, were written by the International Conference on Harmonization and the guidelines were passed into EU law six years later in 1996 uh, and into Japanese and US law one year after that. Most other regulatory authorities around the world accept them now. The only change since then, apart from various pieces of enacting legislation that individual countries and areas have put in place, was the 2016 revision of good clinical practice rules. The main reason for these was that between 1990 and 2016, there had been enormous advances in the processing of data 
that meant that trials could handle vast amounts of more information than they did in 1990. So different safeguards needed to be brought in. The other main change was improvements in risk monitoring and risk management techniques. So that's the history. Ultimately, if you simplify GCP, it has two overarching aims. Aim number one is to protect the rights and safety of participants. Now you'll see I'm using the word participant all the way through this webinar um, to mean the people who are participating in a trial. Sometimes they're described as subjects, sometimes they're described as volunteers, sometimes they're described as patients, but I'm using the term participant just so that there's no confusion. The second aim is to ensure that the results of trials are scientifically valid. So I'm going to ask you an open question. If you were coming up with the rules of GCP, and to give you a clue, there's 13 of them, bearing in mind the aims of protecting the rights and safety of participants and ensuring results are scientifically valid, what do you think that the clinical trial rules ought to include. And this is particularly a shout out to those people who've said that they don't really know much about GCP. So if you'd like to type any comments to me in the chat box, um, I'm just gonna leave it open for 30 seconds. I can see a few people are putting things in already. So what do you think the clinical trials should include or what should they cover, anything like that? Okay, well, we've got a few answers now. Um, one very popular answer is a lot of people had said consent, informed consent, um, so yes, that's absolutely important. It's very important that the participant in the trial agrees to be in the trial, but also knows what they're getting into. And I'm going to cover informed consent a little bit later on the, in this webinar. Um, is the drug safe is another one. Is the trial morally justified? Is the trial scientific? Well, that's aim number one. So yeah, um, aim number two rather, so that absolutely. Are there enough people to run the trial properly? Well, that, that's that's, that is important, that's quite a good one. Um, but if I can now go through the 13 principles of GCP and all of those points that people have been raised are on there. Principle number one, trials have got to be ethical. Number two, the risks of the trial have to be weighed against the potential benefits. And that's not just for the participant, but for society as well. And this really needs to be seen in conjunction with number two that whatever the potential benefits to society if the rights and safety and well-being of the participants um, they are they're always more important than the interests of science and society so even if the benefit to society is very great if the risk to a participant is too great then it shouldn't the trial shouldn't be allowed under gcp rules Number four, evidence regarding the test drug has got to be enough to support the trial. Trials have got to be scientific and properly defined. That's aim number two. Trials must be carried out as approved by the ethics board who reviewed it. We'll talk about um, ethics committees in a while. And seven, participants must receive medical care and have medical decisions made by appropriately qualified doctors. This is very important. Being involved in a medical trial should not mean you get worse medical treatment than if you hadn't been involved in a medical trial. So you have to have that medical oversight. So carrying on. Uh, people involved in running a trial have got to be qualified by training and experience. The participants have got to have freely given their informed consent. Yep, several people mentioned informed consent. All clinical information has to be recorded in a way that makes it possible to accurately report, verify and interpret. This is part of aim two, that the trials need to be scientifically valid. 
Records that could identify participants must be kept secure and confidential. Now this is paper records, electronic records, everything. Test drugs should be manufactured, handled, stored and used properly. And the final principle, there have to be systems in place at every stage to ensure quality. Okay, so those are your 13 overarching principles of good clinical practice. So these are, if you like, operated by certain groups of people or roles. Um, first of all, is the ethics committee or ethics committees. Second is the competent authority. This is the name given to the regulatory authority in the particular country where the trial is taking place, but it's called under GCP the competent authority. The investigator, the sponsor, and the monitor. Now I'll talk about each of these separately and explain just what they do and what the differences are. So first of all, the ethics committee. Now everyone's heard of ethics committees. Um, they're called slightly different things in different countries. They might be called independent review boards or IRBs or REBs or all sorts of things like that. But ultimately, their role is the same. Before a trial begins, they look at the risks of a trial. They review the information that's gonna be given to all of the participants taking part in the trial. They review the qualifications of the investigator and they review the protocol. I'll talk about the protocol. Protocol is essentially the, the rule book that says this is how a trial is going to be run. These are, this is the methodology, this is what it's going to prove, et cetera, et cetera, or this is what it's going to investigate. Um, and based on all that information, they will either approve, ask for more information, modification, or they will reject an application to do the research. So you can see the ethics review process is absolutely essential. During a trial, they've also got a role. They have to review the trial at least annually. And this is essentially to make sure that the trial is being run in line with the, the trial that they approved. So to make sure that the protocol is being followed, it is being run ethically. If they determine it isn't being run ethically, they can actually terminate a trial. So, a quick question. I'm going to ask a new poll, which is, who do you think ought to be in an ethics committee? Who would be the right people to be in an ethics committee? So, let's just save the results of the old poll. Here we go, open, open poll. Okay, I'm just gonna again leave this up for a minute or two. Um, there's a group of different people. Who do you think, I'm not saying the ethics committee should have all of these people, but do you think that any of these people sound like they ought to be relevant people to be in an ethics committee? So again, I'm just gonna leave this up for a little while. Okay, it's interesting. Okay, I'm gonna close it in a few seconds. So if you're part way through, if you can finish off, that would be great. Yeah, and I see some people have typed into the um, some people have typed into chat as well. Okay, lovely. So let's share that result. So we've got an ethics expert that was quite popular. Um, second most popular expert in regulations, uh, expert in the disease being studied. This is all very good stuff. Um, Really, the answer is all of these and more, essentially. Uh, the Ethics Committee needs to have, in practice, at least five people. 
the rules say it needs to be a reasonable number of members and collectively they need to have the qualifications and the experience to review and evaluate all of the aspects of the trial. So that's the science, the medical aspect and the ethics of the trial. So the general recommendation is at least five members. One person needs to be a lay person and what I mean by that is that their main focus of interest is non-scientific. Doesn't mean there couldn't be more than one lay person, but at least one person. One person needs to be independent of the institution or trial site. Um, and only those who are not connected with the investigator or sponsor, I'll say about what those roles are in a second, can vote on trial related matters. So in other words, they're independent. What a trial can do is they can temporarily add specific experts as they need it. I see a couple of people have put in the chat box research pro um, healthcare professionals and clinicians. So, yep, all of these people would be relevant to be in an ethics committee. Lovely. So let's move on and say what, what does the ethics committee actually do? Well, before a trial begins, they review the safety quality, uh, sorry, sorry, competent authority. The competent authority is the regulatory body that's present in the, the country where a trial's being, um, being run. It has a slightly different remit to the ethics committee because it's more focused on the quality, safety and data on the test drug. So is, it, is there enough information known about the drug? Does it appear to be safe enough for the trial to go ahead? And it gives an opinion on the proposed trial. It has a very important role during the trial because it's the competent authority that gets sent any reports of anything that's seriously gone wrong. Um, and based on those, it maintains or it can change its opinion. And then after the trial finishes, it reviews what they call the study report. I'll talk about all these documents at the end, so don't, don't worry about the, the names now. So the first individual we're going to talk about is the investigator. The investigator plays an absolutely essential role because they are responsible for anything to do with the site where the trial is being run and also anything to do with the participants. And this includes the medical care of patients, communication with the ethics committee, managing the test drug at the site, making sure it's stored correctly, making sure it's, it's um, given out correctly, et cetera, et cetera, and all the records are kept, randomizing and blinding, now, for those who don't have a medical background, um, you've probably come across the term blinding before. Essentially, it is um, when you're taking part in a drug trial, you won't know whether you're going to be given the actual drug or a control substance. And that way, people can't unconsciously or consciously influence the result. Uh, it also gives you a baseline against which you can compare the action of the drug. So this is known as blinding. Um, then there's record keeping. So those are the key roles for the investigator. There are others, but those are the key ones. The next um, person or body that's important is the sponsor. Uh, and I put in bold letters the buck stops here because the sponsor is normally the drug company that developed the test drug, they might be a government organization, but the important thing is it's the sponsor that initiates, manages and funds the trial. And their responsibilities include hiring the investigators, all the financial aspects, and that includes compensating people on trials for their time and if anything goes wrong. Um, their responsible for trial design, they're responsible for quality assurance and quality control, the manufacture, coding, and labeling of the test drug, reporting of any adverse reactions, and trial audits. Now, it's worth mentioning contract research organizations, or CROs. These are quite often employed by sponsors to carry out part of a trial on their behalf. It's especially useful as I put here, where the sponsor is relatively small, 
it might not have a presence in a particular country, or it might be doing a study on a particular group of people that are you know, hard to um, access. So for example, they might be doing work on people in care homes. So there are contract research organizations that specialize in managing those type of trials. Uh, the sponsor still has got ultimate responsibility, so they can't pass the buck to the CRO. So it's absolutely vital that watertight contracts are in place between the CRO and the sponsor. They all know exactly who's responsible for what, and there's a very clear, um, unhindered channel of information both ways. Uh, okay, so there's contract research organizations, and then there's also the monitor. Now, for those who haven't worked out, the reason there's a picture of a lizard, it's a monitor lizard. Um, I apologize. Um, the monitor actually works for the sponsor, and their job, as the name suggests, is to monitor the trials. They make sure that the trial is running as it ought to. Uh, and their particular responsibilities are making sure that the participants are all safe, that their rights are being protected, that the data that's being captured is accurate, complete, and verifiable, and that the trial is complying with the rules of GCP and any local regulations. <coughs> Excuse me. And they do this through monitoring visits, and the monitoring visits take place either before a trial starts whilst the trial's going on or at the end. But what happens in a monitoring visit is going to be different depending on which part of that, which stage the trial's at. So for example, if a monitoring visit takes place before a trial begins, then the kind of thing they'll be looking at is um, whether the staff are properly trained or not. Are the facilities adequate? Um, has the investigator got the right qualifications? During the clinical phases of the trial, they'll look at things like, is the test drug being stored properly? You know, perhaps it needs to be stored below a particular temperature. Are there monitoring things in place to make sure that temperature doesn't get exceeded? Is the investigator following the rules of the protocol? If there have been any changes to the protocol for whatever reason, have all those changes been distributed to the site? Uh, and if anything's gone wrong, if there's any adverse events, are they being properly reported? And then after the clinical phases of the trial, they'll be looking at things like, um, <coughs> excuse me, whether all the essential documents have been filed properly, um, whether any unused test drug has been disposed of following local regulations and sponsor roles, things like that. So these are the key people and the key roles in good clinical practice. There are also key processes. Informed consent. I mentioned this at the beginning, and as I said, several of you put informed consent as something that was important in the rules of GCP. Then there's safety reporting and documentation. Those three processes are absolutely vital. So I'll talk about informed consent. It's usually a two-stage process. If someone's interested in joining a clinical trial, after initial vetting to make sure they're suitable, part one would be that they're given information on the disease or the condition that the trial is looking at. Uh, they're told what's going to happen during and after the trial, or what's likely to happen. Um, any treatment that could be withheld or given to them, so they need to understand what medical and medical treatment they're likely to get, what their responsibilities are, and very importantly, they need to have the negatives of being in the trial, if there are any, weighed against the positives. Part two is where they're given more information and they actually give their consent, um, fill, out, fill out a consent form. Now, some jurisdictions, it depends where you're running the trial, actually require a cooling off period between the two. So part one, you might have one day and then a minimum of 24 hours before you're called back for part two, just to make sure you haven't changed your mind, at which point you fill out your consent form. So the consent form itself, I've got a question here. Um, I don't particularly want you to type the answer, just read it and have a think. If this appeared in the information given to someone, 
who was looking at consenting for a trial, what would be wrong with it? The test drug has been shown to elicit a slightly raised risk of myocardial infarction in patients prone to cardiac arrhythmia. Okay, well, there's several things wrong with that. One, the information that backs up informed consent, you need to avoid medical terminology. Use straightforward, clear language where possible. Avoid vague statements like slightly. And the final thing is ensure that any wording is age and literacy appropriate. And this is where it's important to know the profile of the people who are actually taking part in the trial. So here I've got an example of how that could be worded in a better way. The information is still there, but it's just clearer. The test drug has been shown to cause a higher risk of heart attack in patients with irregular heartbeats. You've not lost any information, but more people are going to be able to understand it. And bear in mind, people who have volunteered for a trial and are taking part in an informed consent discussion are going to be out of their comfort zone. So they're not necessarily going to be happy saying that they don't understand something. So you need to assume that um, information is must be presented as clearly as possible. It's possible that the person who's having the informed consent discussion can't read, or they, um, they might be below a certain age. Um, so it's quite acceptable to have things like this. Um, the interest, oh, someone's got their microphone off, on, never mind. Um, this is from an article that's ironically has quite a complicated title, a didactic approach to presenting verbal and visual information to children participating in research protocols. The comic book informs. <laughs> oh, someone needs to mute their microphone. Ah, it's gone silent, that's good. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with this. It's nice and clear and obvious. The person would just put a, a tick or a, uh, a cross in whichever, whichever box they think is appropriate. I'm just trying to work out whose microphone isn't muted. Right, okay, not to worry. Uh, it could also um, extend to having sort of cartoons like this showing just what's gonna happen during a trial. And also there's no reason why you shouldn't have a relatively straightforward worded statement that someone signs so that they can they can understand what they're signing. The crucial thing about the informed consent, <coughs> it's not just the consent, it's the pairing, it's the informed consent. They're giving consent because they understand what they're getting into. Okay, the next important part is safety reporting. When something goes wrong with anyone in a, in a um, clinical trial, you have to ask several questions. And the first question is, did this adverse event, so this bad thing that happened, was it before or after the test drug had been administered? If it was before, you don't need to do anything. Record it, but don't you don't need to do anything. You don't need to report it any further because it clearly wasn't caused by the test drug. You may need to report it. Uh, you may need to record it because it's possible that some adverse events could mean that the person might not be able to participate in the trial anymore. <coughs> Excuse me, but you know that it wasn't caused by the test drug. So if we're assuming it was after the test drug. Is the, re is the whatever happened, is it serious? If it's not, you record it in the CRF, which is the case record form. I'll talk about that in a minute. If it was serious, was it expected? And by expected, I mean, is it something that you know from the profile of the test drug it's likely to happen? Is it something you know from the profile of the volunteers on the trial it's likely to happen? Um, so yes, it was expected. Tell the sponsor immediately and they report it to the competent authority following whatever the competent authority's rules are. Whatever their timetable is, <coughs> follow that. Let's assume it wasn't expected. Is it likely to have been caused 
by the test drug? No, you're sure it wasn't caused by the test drug. So let's give you an example. Somebody takes part in a clinical trial, they have a test drug, they walk home and they get run over by a bus. They're hospitalized, it's serious, really bad, but you're pretty sure it wasn't caused by the test drug. Unless, of course, the test drug made them woozy, but you're pretty sure that it wasn't caused by the test drug. So you tell the sponsor immediately, and again, they report it to the competent authority following the competent authority's rules. Let's assume you think it was likely to have been caused by the test drug. Was it potentially fatal? You already know it's serious, so was it potentially fatal? Yes, it was potentially fatal. So the sponsor needs to be told immediately, and then they, within seven days, need to report it to the competent authority plus competent authorities in all other countries where the trial might be being run and the ethics committee and investigators. The only difference if it's not potentially fatal is they've got slightly longer in which to report it, but they still must report it to the competent authorities in any countries where the trial is taking place along, the, along with the ethics committee and investigators. So, Let's look at the, the, the terms involved in safety reporting. There's a few terms that are used all the time, and it's just worth quickly going through. Adverse event, anything bad that happens. Not necessarily related to a drug, but just anything bad that happens. Somebody bangs their knee on the way to, into a clinic. That's an adverse event. Serious adverse event. As the name suggests, it's an adverse event that has more serious repercussions. Adverse drug reaction. Now, this is where you're sure or you think there's a causal relationship to the medicinal product. So you think there's at least a possibility that the test drug was what caused that adverse reaction. Bear in mind that before a medicine is approved for use, then the amount of clinical experience with it is, is by definition quite limited. So any noxious or unintended responses to a medic medicinal product related to any dose need to be considered as adverse drug reactions. You then have the SUSAR. This is where it's suspected unexpected. So unexpected, it wasn't something that was in the profile of the drug. You weren't expecting it to happen. Serious adverse reaction. This is what we were talking about in the previous illustration where expedited reporting applies. So in other words, it needs to be reported in a, in a, a more speedy process than usual to the competent authority. Okay, so as I said, it's not, it's unexpected because it's not consistent with the product information you've got, which is why the uh, investigator brochure is so important. Important. So let's look at the um, important trial documents. Uh, um, there are certain ones that are absolutely crucial to ensure that a trial is run properly, but also to ensure that when the trial finishes, you've actually got the information that you need. The investigator brochure, if you like, this is the user guide, the, the, the manual for the experimental drug. It's got all of the safety and efficacy data that's known, including any preclinical data. Uh, and the purpose is really to, um, it's twofold. One, it's to help the ethics committee determine that the, the trial is you know, um, the correct risk level and the competent authority to decide that. But also it's so that the investigator can make a judgment call about whether something, um, whether any adverse reaction is likely to have been caused by the drug. So it's to do with risk and it's to do with assessing um, adverse events, but it's also to do with the proper management of the experimental product. Clinical trial protocol, CTP, or just protocol. This is the document used to gain confirmation of the trial design. 
by the Ethics Committee and it must be followed by all study investigators even if trials are being run in different countries. It's okay to have the protocol in different languages but it needs to be the same protocol. If the protocol is modified for some reason, it needs to be modified universally. Uh, the protocol, it describes the scientific rationale, the objectives, the design methodology, the statistical considera <laughs> considerations and organization of the planned trial. Now the next one, standard operating procedures, I've got those in red for a very good reason because they are the bedrock of most of the processes within good clinical practice. And they, it's st having standard operating procedures that are clear, documented and available for whoever needs them underpins most of these processes and ensures that people follow the same rules wherever they are. Um, and it's very important that people have the right version of standard operating procedures. So if they're updated, you need firm version control just to make sure that everyone is going from the same set of rules. The informed consent form we've already talked about. The case record form. Now the case record form is designed by the sponsor, completed by an investigator and checked by the monitor. And essentially it is one document that has all of the information that the call says needs to be reported to the sponsor for each participant. And the case record form is something that it's very important that the monitor checks. One of their roles will be to look at the case record form and look at the original data. So it could be look at the notebooks that the people have been writing records in, make sure that everything tallies. If there's a correction in a notebook or something, that the correction has been made in such a way you can see the original, uh, it's initialed so you know who made the change, et cetera, et cetera. So they will check the paper trail that the case record form is absolutely accurate. Monitoring report, this is the report that a monitor produces when they do a monitoring visit. And finally, periodic safety reports. Now, elephant in the room. I can't really talk about GCP without talking about how GCP is working during COVID-19. Clinical trials have got to happen. Um, you can't just pull the plug on clinical trials, it may well be that there are uh, people whose health would quite severely suffer if you did that, apart from the, you know, the cost of um, shelving trials. So there are certain things that should be done during COVID-19 to make sure that the trials are run in as pragmatic and sensible a way as possible. First of all, of course, prioritize the safety of the participants and staff. None of these rules fly in the face of GCP, but they basically just look at the situation and deal with things pragmatically. Maintain remote contact with participants. Now, this is really for two reasons. One, you may well not be seeing the trial participants face to face as often as you would normally do. So part of it is to make sure that the um, health and the condition of the participants is being monitored effectively, even though you're not seeing them physically. But the other thing that's very important is participants are people. They're gonna be nervous at being part of a trial. They're gonna be doubly nervous at being part of a trial during COVID-19. So it's very important to make sure that participants are reassured because it's going to improve engagement and it will help ensure that they don't just leave the trial. Bear in mind that trials often benefit the people who are involved. So it's not in their best interests or your best interests if they leave the trial. Identify and focus on the factors that are critical to safety and quality. Work with the trial sites. Bear in mo mind most trial sites are um, run by things like the NHS. So they are a health service that's going to be, at best, grossly overstretched. So are there things you can do to, to help that? For example, if you're working with a trial site and let's say trial samples are taking longer to get to the lab and get analyzed by the lab than usual, 
are there local labs you could work with? Are there private labs? Are there different um, couriers you could be using? Just, just think around things to try and take the pressure off the trial site. And bear in mind, identify what can and cannot be captured remotely. Now, some competent authorities aren't inspecting at all. Others are taking a risk-based approach, looking at remote inspection or limited physical inspection. Check. Check with your competent authority what they're doing. And where you have to do an audit, prioritize and postpone any that are lower risk. Document everything. Don't forget at the end of COVID-19, everything's going to have to be picked apart and it's going to have to make sense. Centralize um, and use remote monitor oversight. That ties in with what I've said before. Finally, this is very important. If there are any changes to a protocol, make sure you identify any that are caused by COVID-19 and that you're willing to show that. Bear in mind regulators risk being absolutely swamped with protocol deviations at the moment. They're going to be short staffed, so work with them. Okay, well that is the end of the talk. Um, I have got a few minutes for some questions. Now people have been sending questions in throughout, so if I can, if, if you have any questions now, feel free to type them, but I'll start off with some of the ones that have already come in. Um, what kind of protocol deviations need to be sent to the competent authority and the ethics committee? Um, okay, well, it's all significant deviations. Oh, someone's microphone's on. I can hear feedback. Yeah, all significant deviations need prior written approval of the competent authority and the ethics committee before they're implemented. There is an exception to that. If there's a change to the protocol because a risk has been identified and that change is to help eliminate the risk, it's absolutely fine to implement that first. Um, other question is, can consent be given for someone else? Okay. Um, yes, the, um, it can. If patient can't consent themselves, that's, for example, say someone's in a coma, um, it could be given by a representative, um, either a member of family or a legal representative. If a person is a minor, I've already talked about having the um, the informed consent document written in such a way that the participant will understand, but there's nothing wrong with having two versions, one for the parent and one for the child, but bear in mind you should always try and get the um, consent of the person who's actually taking part. Um, if someone can't read or write, you can have an impartial witness there for the entire informed consent discussion um, and the participant should um, then consent orally and the witness would sign on their behalf. Okay, I better stop there because there's a risk of time running away with me. Thank you so much for listening. Um, before you go, just to let you know, in two weeks, We'll be holding a webinar on good laboratory practice presented by the person who wrote our good laboratory practice course. If you're interested, just visit whitehalltraining.com slash GLP webinar. If you don't know what GLP is, um, it applies to non-clinical studies that are designed to assess whether chemicals are safe or effective. Uh, and whether they're safe to people, animals, and the environment. It's not about wearing lab coats and wearing goggles in a lab. Um, it's about testing things like um, um, food packaging, uh, food additives. Um, it can also be pharmaceuticals, but to see what their environmental and safety impact is. So there's the, there's the um, URL if you're interested, please feel free to join. 
Um, if you want some more information about good clinical practice, then uh, Whitehall Training, we have a range of GCP courses in several different languages. Um, obviously, the, the, uh, the point of GCP is to have overarching rules that apply in any country, but different countries have slightly different interpretations or ways of following the rules. So we do have courses that are tailored to specific countries. We've got one for the US, we've got one for Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So do have a look at our website if you're interested. Um, I will be emailing the people who joined the webinar with a discount code. So if you are interested in personally taking some of our GCP training, this code will allow you to get it at half price. If you are one of our existing customers who perhaps might buy by invoice, then feel free to email me. Um, the half price offer would stand for orders of up to 20 licenses. So I can apply the um, discount and then invoice you as usual. Um, but it's, it's really intended for the people who have um, sat through the entire webinar. Um, uh, all it remains for me to say is um, I just wanted to mention a parent company Infonetica. Infonetica, we're a software as a service company, and it was Infonetica who designed the platform that Whitehall Training Training is offered on. Uh, the other kind of things that we offer is um, we've got systems for ethics committee review. So we've got um, systems that large universities use so that applicants can fill out their application form and send it automatically to the ethics committee and the ethics committee can comment back again. So we've got those. We also have um, products for clinical trial management. So for handling all of the data that's involved in clinical trials. Okay, well, I'd just like to say again, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope all of you are staying safe and I hope you'll remain safe and um, I will be in touch and I'll send a recording of this out to everyone. Thank you very much.